Hey guys, Cole Beeler here talking about COVID transmission. Are you safe in the hospital? How do you protect yourself from COVID when it is everywhere? Am I a danger to my family when I go home? When do I need extra special precautions? These are extremely valid questions in an era with a disease that can spread rapidly and silently, kill people more effectively than many respiratory viruses, and doesn't have great treatment options. So much is still unknown about this virus, but we have had a chance to accumulate some data by this point in time. Instead of regressing to the miasma theory of disease spread, let's talk about what we do know. COVID-19 is a respiratory virus. It spreads from the respiratory tract of infected individuals. Even though we may detect virus in different organs, it does not effectively spread from the GI tract, tears, urine, bone, or other body fluids and tissues. I acknowledge that virus has been detected or receptors have been found in these tissues, but that does not mean the virus can adequately disseminate itself from these organs to get to the respiratory target tissue of the next host. Non-respiratory transmission would be atypical for any respiratory virus and even more atypical for coronaviruses. Transmission via inanimate surfaces is likely extremely rare. Uh, even in studies that have suggested it's possible, viable virus isn't commonly detected. RNA presence does not mean live virus. Transmission from mother in utero or in the birthing process is rare. Infection may happen after delivery, but the consequences of this thankfully are very, very low. Though they are still infectious, patients without symptoms don't transmit as well as those with symptoms. That said, 48 hours before you develop symptoms, you are likely quite contagious, and this pre-symptomatic group is difficult to sort out from those that remain asymptomatic their entire course. Healthcare worker infections are common, uh, but are multifactorial and may not solely be due to clinical exposures. The most common location for transmission of COVID is in the home uh, to people who you are living with. Older are more likely to get it than younger, spouses more likely than children. Children don't seem to be able to transmit the infection as well uh, as adults. I acknowledge that they probably have equal amounts of viral RNA in their oropharynx, but this does not mean that they are more infectious. And epidemiologic data cited here seem to imply uh, they may not be as effective vectors. But any rule that we try and build for COVID are incomplete. Uh, there is literature in either direction. So how do we best protect each other with the resources that we have available? The first step is to understand that transmission of COVID is a function of time, distance, and density. The longer you're around someone with COVID, the higher likelihood you will get COVID. The closer you are to someone with COVID, the higher likelihood you will get COVID. The more COVID present in the space around you, the higher likelihood you will get COVID. Now, host factors may come into play here, but the data is on shakier ground, so I'm going to leave it out for now, but we'll learn more about it in the future. Uh, we have settled on a rule of six feet for 15 minutes to define risk, but this is not an exact science. It, it's a great approximation, but if any single variable here is high enough, infection could occur. By understanding this, we can help protect our neighbors as we would ourselves. A general understanding of aerosols is probably helpful. Uh, you may hear things get separated out based on the size of the infectious particle or droplet in the air. Very small droplets may hang out in the air uh, for long enough to have the water evaporate around them, leaving a small infectious particle that can travel long distances and potentially through the meshwork of medical masks. Viruses that transmit this way are typically very infectious and have high attack rates. Measles is the prototypical example. Since they can spread throughout a building, uh, we need to exhaust them outside so they can't get to other people. But that whole description is probably overly simplistic. First, for every pulmonary infection, a mixture of aerosol sizes is likely created. We've detected everything from flu to rhinovirus suspended in air uh, in these particles. Sometimes these droplet nuclei can actually penetrate medical masks, um, which are the masks that we use for those infections normally. Infectivity of aerosols may increase over time if the air isn't released from its container. This is that density part we were talking about. The next points are important. Just because we find a virus in a droplet nucleus or far away from a patient, it doesn't mean that droplet precautions are inadequate. Like I said before, we find most viruses in droplet nuclei, but the key is that droplet precautions are adequate to prevent infection of them. 
It may be that medical masks blunt enough of the aerosol to prevent infectivity. It may be that the virus doesn't transmit as well from that size of droplet. It may be that you don't get a high enough dose of the virus from anything but droplets, whatever. Regardless, it's important to note that aerosol distribution does not mean airborne precautions of all viruses. This decision should be made by epidemiologic data for the given virus. Who is spreading it to whom and what are they doing? So the main question, uh, does COVID need N95s and negative airflow rooms in all cases? I would say sometimes, but not for routine care. Why? Well, for one, proximity is the key factor associated with transmission. That is typical for viruses that spread predominantly by the droplet route. Droplet nuclei don't have that proximity factor as strongly associated. For instance, in a train outbreak with another respiratory virus, say paraflu, uh, I would expect risk of infection to be higher the closer you are to that index patient. If you had a train outbreak with measles, that risk would be spread relatively equally among those in the same car. The former is more similar to COVID outbreaks that we've seen in air and train travel thus far. Second, masking, it doesn't matter what type, reduces the acquisition of COVID. This not only argues for a primary respiratory route of infection, but also argues that even cloth masks are effective at blunting the infectious aerosols. So why all the excitement about N95s? Well, they are certainly a better filter when compared under laboratory conditions. N95s were better at protecting the recipient and source from transmission of the virus that surgical, than surgical masks which themselves were better than cloth masks, but I would argue, do you really need all that filtration power to decrease disease acquisition? In this meta-analysis of four randomized controlled trials, they found no difference between N95s and medical masks for the prevention of respiratory viral infection. The quality of the individual studies here was relatively low, but it's probably as good as we're going to get for questions like these. The CDC acknowledges that the predominant mode of transmission is by droplets and is dictated by distance. They acknowledge as well that there are certain situations where COVID may spread like small droplet nucleus pathogens. There have been case reports, case reports, mind you, of transmissions that break our six foot 15 minute rule. These have been in situations with poor ventilation and clustering like restaurants, gyms, choir practices, etc. Because of this, the CDC recommends using N95s instead of medical masks when available, but does the ability of the virus to break the rules under optimal conditions dictate a standardized approach? I would say no. I'm going to describe a virus for you. It can remain in the air and infectious for 24 hours in droplet nuclei. It's been reported to infect people despite wearing medical masks. There have been clusters of multiple infections from one index case, and there are outbreaks cited with long-range, high attack rates. Sounds a lot like COVID, right? What virus could this be? Well, it's actually good old influenza, uh, but that's weird. Uh, with all those super scary facts, why do we only use droplet precautions for flu? Familiarity is the key here. The CDC has a standardized approach to all novel respiratory pathogens. The N95 certainly is a better filter under experimental conditions, and if there's any plausible suggestion a virus could be infectious in droplet nuclei over long or short distances, the REC is N95s. I, I think that's a fair approach until we get better data on the pathogen, but we are out of that window period for COVID, and we are learning more and more every day. They acknowledge that medical masks are an acceptable alternative if there are resource constraints. They do not cite evidence of risk with this scenario, just that there's lack of data. I would say that even with our current stockpiles, we have to be good stewards with our devices. We have already seen how behavior shifts can greatly diminish supply and projections at even one hospital. We never want to be in a position where we can't give an N95 to a person who is intubating a COVID patient. The implications of calling something an airborne pathogen that can spread by droplet nuclei and then not putting a patient in a negative pressure room also seems inconsistent to me. Every time we leave a patient in a regular room but elect to wear N95s, are we sending a message that we don't care about the patient's neighbors who share the same ventilation or the nurses and healthcare workers in the hallway? These mechanisms of spread go hand in hand. If we aren't seeing spread in these areas, why do we also need N95s? The CDC also tends to approach any hint of evidence as the potential rule. COVID certainly has evidence of droplet nucleus spread. However, it is rare, uh, as it is with all respiratory viruses. The problem with this generalization is that it sets the standards that if I don't have an N95, I'm less protected, more at risk, and need to escalate my concerns as a matter of safety. 
In actuality, this is a numbers game. Is there an elevated risk for you caring for a COVID patient with the surgical mask versus N95 when transmission through the former uh, is extremely rare? Maybe, but it's negligible and given all the other constraints, to me, does not seem worth the potential costs. You can see here that we're not alone. Many other national and international healthcare systems and societies endorse an approach of either surgical mask or N95 when caring for COVID patients. I completely acknowledge that others may come to different conclusions from the data available. That's okay. Uh, we have supply. Team members should be encouraged to wear N95s in settings where they could be at elevated risk. But with the dearth of evidence in national, international guidelines going either way, we certainly can't mandate N95s for the care of COVID patients. But when could we encourage them? Remember, transmission is a function of time, distance, and infection density. It is the product of these variables. If any one gets too large, it may overpower the others and lead to infection. Infection prevention can't do that math for you. You have to evaluate your risk and make those decisions based on the care that you're providing. I definitely don't think you need N95s for the majority of activities, but certain activities that disproportionately augment one of these variables may also be associated with risk. A pertinent, exa a pertinent example um, are the aerosol generating procedures. We define aerosol generating procedures as procedures that create high velocity or fluid or air um, against the respiratory epithelium and have evidence in the literature for transmission of respiratory viruses. It's not enough to just create an aerosol. Those are made by almost everything. Farting is an aerosol generating procedure, uh, but is it conducive to transmitting the disease? Where's the evidence? So do I feel like you're safe in the hospital? Yes, but only if you and the people around you are wearing medical masks. Studies have shown that universal masking with medical masks significantly reduces healthcare worker positivity, but it only works if you wear it. Speak up if you see someone breaking the rules. The corollary to that is to not take offense if someone tells you that your nares are hanging out. The most vulnerable time is when you're eating and drinking. Uh, this needs to be in isolation. Eating around other people has already resulted in transmissions. Remember that anyone could be infected. Don't work if you're sick. That's a duh moment. And lastly, wash your hands frequently. It helps with literally everything. So since surgical masks are so effective, how do we handle exposures in the hospital environment? Let me start out by saying that it is uh, at least as common to get infected in the community where people only wear cloth masks as it is in the hospital and, and likely more common depending on what you're doing outside of work. The CDC acknowledges that contact tracing is not worthwhile in the hospital setting when COVID is going crazy. It is impossible to tease out hospital exposures from community exposures and the merit of quarantine in the setting uh, with a limited workforce that is universally masking is very, very low. I acknowledge that our patients do not wear medical masks while we are in their rooms, but we consider these situations safe for the provider, assuming they're wearing a mask, for all other respiratory viruses and would not consider this a trigger for exposure workups. Certainly, if you feel you are going to be with a patient for an extended period of time or in very close approximation, it might make sense to have them wear a mask as well, if they can tolerate it. We don't have criteria built up around this, but like so many things, you need to analyze your individual risk based on your activities and apply the appropriate PPE. Do you need a policy to tell you whether or not to wear gloves during a rectal exam? The only situation where we would consider you exposed and at risk for spreading to your family would be if you were exposed to an aerosol generating procedure of a COVID patient without an N95. Uh, in this situation, you can expect to hear from us and get guidance uh, about how to handle your home life. I also want to reiterate that even if you are exposed, you can continue to work in the hospital until you develop symptoms. Viral loads peak on the day of your symptoms, uh, but they're going up about 48 hours before this. Um, that said, the risk uh, of shedding to other people while you're wearing a mask and they're wearing a mask is negligible. We operate the same, we operate under the same assumption that all team members are shedding at all times. Uh, the bang for the buck of contact tracing just isn't there due to the protection the masks provide and the fact that universal masking and symptom monitoring practices wouldn't change. So uh, th this, this is my summary slide. What, what I would say in general is that in the hospital, COVID transmits predominantly by a droplet nucleus. Uh, ventilation is good. Uh, aerosol size does not affect transmission potential. The epidemiology shows us where the risk is. 
The CDC routinely recommends N95s for all respiratory viruses, especially new ones, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're always needed. And, and, and they suggest that as well by allowing surgical masks as an option. Universal masking is crucial in the healthcare environment, and we absolutely need to adhere to this whenever possible. The last thing I'd say is that it, infection is a function of time, distance, and density. So mind those variables when you're applying care to patients. Please reach out to me if you've got questions, and thanks for listening.